Um, I think it's very clear where we will go in the discussion. So now we go to the other talks first. And now Rob Martinson uh, here in Cold Spring Harbor and also professor at the Howard Huge Medical Institute. Uh, go, please, sir, tell us about epigenetics, how we, where you are. All right. <clears throat> well, it's great to have this opportunity to tell you uh, about uh, our work on sustainability. I'm, I'm actually going to give the first of two talks on oil palm. Oil palm, of course, is one of the most challenging crops in the world to grow in a sustainable fashion. Uh, this is because much of it is grown uh, in extremely sensitive environmental regions, as illustrated by this photograph, aerial photograph of Borneo showing some of the oldest rainforest on earth uh, on the left and an oil palm plantation on the right. Oil palm actually uh, is one of the most important sources of uh, edible oil in the world, uh, vegetable oil. Uh, and in fact, uh, human use and, and probably cultivation dates back at least 5,000 years to early civilizations in West Africa. Um, and, and there are some, some other uh, very uh, interesting uh, historical uh, attributes associated with it on this slide. Uh, and uh, recently, it's also been a major use for biofuels uh, because of its uh, oil uh, um, composition. And all these things have increased demand for palm oil uh, in the last few years. And, and my colleague uh, from Malaysia, uh, Ravi, will tell you a lot more about the economics and the sustainability in, in the next talk. I'm going to focus on what we can do with genetics and epigenetics to try to improve not only yield, but also the reproducibility of yield with the intent of reducing land use, making land use far more efficient uh, in these very sensitive environments. And we're going to start just by looking at some uh, very uh, classical uh, genetic data. Uh, there are a whole variety of oil palms uh, throughout Africa in e Guineensis, uh, and uh, early breeders uh, discovered several traits uh, that they recognized were actually controlled by single genes, although they were originally thought of as subspecies. Uh, fruit color, for example, uh, which I think Ravi's going to mention a bit more, is very important for ripening. Uh, the most important single gene trait is the thickness of the shell. This is uh, oil palm is related to coconut. Think of that, think of that shell uh, as, uh, as being uh, very important for determining oil yield. Uh, and finally, a detrimental trait, mantled fruit, which I'll tell you a lot more about, which turns out to be uh, epigenetic. Uh, so um, the shell uh, gene, as identified by breeders in the 1920s, uh, exhibits single gene heterosis in a very powerful way. So thick shelled oil palm, known as Dura, is homozygous for the wild type allele, has a very thick shell. Thin or shell-less uh, oil palms, known as Pacifera, are usually female sterile, uh, but they don't have a shell at all, and this makes them uh, a very, very non-productive in all sorts of ways. But the hybrid, the single gene hybrid, Tenera, has a much higher yield than the Dura wild type form. And so breeders for uh, the last 100 years, more or less, have been trying to make hybrids of Tenera uh, uh, oil palm to get the highest yields. Okay, so uh, Tenera hybrids then have much higher yield and are, are the target of, of, uh, of, of, of all these plantations of planting materials. The mantle fruit uh, trait is a much more detrimental trait. Uh, this uh, occurs naturally in some populations, but also in clonal palms, and I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, and mantle fruit uh, has a, a very detrimental effect on oil yield. Shown on the left is a normal uh, bunch of fruit bunch uh, from oil palm. And on the right is a mantle, mantle bunch, uh, which typically has no seed uh, and is, uh, is, is, is extremely low yielding. Uh, these turned out to be a big problem in clonal plantations, as I'll explain in a moment. Uh, more than 10 years ago now, uh, the oil palm genome was sequenced in a collaboration between the Malaysian Oil Palm Board, uh, as represented by Ravi, who led the project and who's going to give the next talk. Uh, also, Orion, a genomics company that I'm associated with, and our colleagues at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, the new oil palm genome uh, consists of 16 chromosomes uh, and has a lot of uh, features that are typical of plant genomes and was released to the public uh, four years ahead of publication uh, in 2009. We could then set about using this genome uh, to identify some of these key traits. And of course, the first uh, to, to be targeted was shell itself, the shell gene. To do this, we took advantage of the wonderful pedigrees that breeders had developed 
Uh, as you can see, oil palm has a pretty long breeding cycle, and uh, these pedigrees started in the 1950s. Uh, and what we were able to do is identify homozygous uh, Pacifera palms uh, from these pedigrees. And we were able to use then a technique known as homozygosity mapping, which was actually first proposed by Lander and Botstein for human genetics back in the 1980s. Uh, we did this using sequencing. Uh, and shown here is just uh, an interval near the shell gene. And you can see there's an awful lot of variation of SNPs uh, uh, between different homozygotes in these breeding pedigrees, except for the region that turned out to be the shell gene. And using additional recombination data from uh, individual uh, F2 populations uh, that had been developed by breeders, uh, we were able to identify the, sh the shell gene itself. It turns out to encode a Madsbox transcription factor related to the Arabidopsis seed stick, uh, a, 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 a D class uh, Madsbox gene. Uh, and uh, we identified at the time just two alleles, one uh, that had been used extensively in breeding uh, for, for the last 50 or more years, uh, the Avros allele, and additional alleles uh, from African germplasm collected by the MPOB, the Malaysian Palm Oil Board. Uh, I just want to highlight this remarkable collection, especially after Sarah's wonderful talk. Um, I think we have, uh, you know, an extraordinary resource here in Malaysia. The Malaysian Palm Oil Board has collected uh, through the efforts of Dr. Rajanaidu Nukia over many, many decades, uh, an extraordinary collection of, of germplasm from, from Africa. And interestingly, by mapping uh, shell alleles uh, to this collection, we were able to trace the origin of, of cultivated diversity to Ghana, to, to West Africa, which again is, is very, um, uh, very consistent with what we know about the history of oil power. So multiple alleles of shell were identified in this collection. And when they were sequenced, it's very interesting, they all fell in the same very small part of the Madsbox transcription factor, right on this uh, alpha helix, which it's actually the DNA binding and heterodimerization domain of the shell gene. And this suggested, and I'm not going to go into all the data, but it suggested that uh, heterodimerization with other Madsbox gene factors, which is well known in this family, might be important for yield. Uh, this actually fit very nicely with a theory that Jim Birchler had come up with years ago about single gene heterosis, in which the dosage of, of, of multi, multimeric uh, subunits of multimeric complexes, uh, because of random association, had to be just right. And if you had too much of one or too much of the other, you would reduce uh, the, the, the number of functional complexes. So actually this fits Jim's theory extraordinarily well. And, uh, and, and, and it's, 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 it's sort of fun to think about. Uh, so the shell gene uh, was uh, an extremely important trait. Um, but breeders uh, realized in the 1970s and actually through the efforts of Unilever when they were involved in oil palm uh, cultivation, uh, that uh, one way to enhance yields uh, dramatically and very rapidly was to clone elite hybrids. So rather than having to cross them every time, which of course is extremely labor intensive and expensive, uh, they realized that you could take, uh, think of the heart of palm from an elite adult uh, oil palm, which you already knew had fantastic yield, and then put it into tissue culture, regenerate plantlets, and get tens of thousands of genetically identical clones, which in principle uh, should be able to give you much higher yield. However, um, uh, very early on, it was realized that at some variable frequency, uh, many of these uh, cloned palms had the mantle trait. Uh, and this mantle trait, as I said, uh, was extremely detrimental. It was frequently parthenocarpic uh, and, uh, and reduced yields and actually uh, really had a negative effect on the cloning industry, if you like, so that at, at the moment only about 1% of oil palm, uh, uh, planted oil palm planting materials are clones. Uh, well, uh, this, uh, this trait uh, was quickly recognized as being epigenetic uh, because of the fact that it reverts and that uh, in crosses it behaves actually, for those of you who know about it, it behaves very much like a paramutant allele. Uh, and uh, early on, uh, we realized, uh, it, it was realized that the phenotype resembles uh, homeotic mutants uh, first identified in, in Antirhinum and in Arabidopsis. Uh, and this particular homeotic mutant was called deficiens, uh, in which the stamens, uh, the male organs, were transformed uh, into female organs, carpels. Uh, and this strong uh, phenotypic resemblance was a, was a clue to what might be going on uh, in this epigenetic trait. But new, no mutation could ever be found in this gene 
and so uh, so it was a mystery for for a long time. So uh, we employed a, uh, a, an epigenome-wide um, association study, if you like. Uh, we've just had a great introduction to the genetic, genetic version. Uh, using uh, DNA microarrays because they could, be, um, they could be used at very high throughput and low cost. So these are uh, restriction enzyme-based DNA microarrays for DNA methylation. The uh, wonderful, uh, again, a collection from MPOB, of uh, hybrid materials which had been cloned uh, and then uh, are, are grouped into mother perms called altets, and then either normal clones or mantle clones. So all three in this trio design should be genetically identical. Uh, and then we looked at methylation across the entire genome and asked for association of loss of methylation or gain uh, with uh, the mantled phenotype specifically. Uh, and this is what that EWAS plot, plot looked like. It was pretty amazing. Uh, that's the entire genome. And there was just really one region that really stood out as having uh, a strong association with the mantle trait. Uh, and this region, uh, when, when we narrowed down, turned out to encode a transposon. Uh, transposons, of course, were discovered here at Cosping Harbor by, by Barbara McClintock, but she also importantly realized she called them controlling elements because she realized they could control gene expression. And here was a great example of a transposon doing exactly that. The transposon uh, was a, a line retrotransposon that was inserted into the intron of the deficiency gene. So this was a, a very, very strong candidate uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the epigenetic trait. You might be uh, wondering where this name karma uh, comes from. It was actually first identified in rice, uh, and I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, but just a little bit more detail. Uh, so uh, by sulfite sequencing of the mantled, normal, and, uh, and, uh, 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 and mother palm, uh, uh, palms were revealed that there was in fact a, a differentially methylated region or DMR right on top of that transposon. And interestingly, it was only differentially methylated in one or, or two of the cytosine sequence contexts. So DNA methylation can occur either as CG, CHG, where H is anything but G, and CHH. And in each of and in CG methylation was unaffected uh, in, in uh, mantled palms, but CHG and CHH were dramatically uh, lost from the karma retrotransposon. As I mentioned, karma had actually been identified first in rice and it had actually been identified as, as one of only two retrotransposons that are strongly activated in rice tissue culture. So that made a great deal of sense. And it was actually called karma because it only transposed in the generation after tissue culture. In other words, in those regenerated plants. So it actually had karma, and so, which, uh, which allowed us uh, to, of course, uh, distinguish the two alleles, uh, the two epi alleles as either good karma or bad karma. And uh, bad karma is associated with hypermethylation uh, of the karma element. And I'm not going to go into any detail, but we actually published a paper more than 10 years ago now in maize uh, showing that DNA methylation can affect splicing. Uh, and in fact, there was a lovely paper in Nature just a couple of years ago from my colleague here at Cold Spring Harbor, Adrian Craner, who showed uh, that uh, histone methylation affects splicing uh, as well. And uh, I, I won't go into the details, but this uh, this, this graph just illustrates that in, in bad karma, uh, aberrant splicing into the transposon truncates the deficiency gene and causes the phenotype. It's also associated uh, with the loss of 24 nucleotide small RNAs, uh, which guide this type of DNA methylation. And they're found uh, in, in normal uh, uh, fruits, but not in mantled fruits. Uh, and also, they are sharply reduced in tissue culture itself. And again, I'm not gonna go into the details now, but we think tissue culture uh, loses this type of methylation. And we actually had a paper recently on current biology showing that uh, it loses this type of methylation uh, and, and, and loses small RNAs at the same time. And we think that this is what's responsible for the phenotype. Okay, so um, this led to uh, my favorite uh, nature cover, uh, Weed Out Bad Karma. Uh, which uh, um, uh, illustrates the uh, illustrates the idea, uh, and Ravi is going to tell you a great deal more about this uh, in in a minute. Um, we think now that with a simple PCR test, uh, we can predict 
the, uh, the Karma epigenotype, uh, as well as the shell genotype and many other uh, genotypes uh, before uh, plant, uh, 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 plantlets shown here on the bottom left uh, are put into the nurse are put into the nursery and into the into the plantation and this allows culling of all of those low yield genotypes and removal of uh, a lot of wasted wasted land and, and an increase in land use efficiency which is which is the goal uh, of this work I need to uh, I need to end just by, by showing the team. So uh, this is Ravi, who's about to give the next talk. The Malaysian Palm Oil Board uh, led the, uh, the genome project. This is the Orion company on, on, on the right, but we had a lot of help from many uh, other uh, genome institutes and, and, uh, and, and, and sequencing uh, companies in, 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 this whole, in this whole endeavor. And they're, they're all listed here. So thanks very much.